My original title didn't have the brackets. <laughs> um, it was Disentangling Internal and External Processes of Change. Um, and I guess this already kind of hints at the conclusion. Um, but, yeah, maybe you know, we don't need to in disentangle them, separate them out um, at all. Um, so, yeah, um, because I wasn't quite sort of sure who was going to be here, there's some stuff that I will skip over since you all know it. Um, but by way of background on language contact, um, so I think there is what I've called here a broad agreement that language change can result from external factors and internal factors. So the kind of external factors being other languages, contact-induced change, um, or internal factors. So whether you want to think of it as a factor, kind of grammaticalization in the ways that languages change internally. Um, there is no consensus on what constrains these types of changes, um, and nor on the interaction between them. Um, so there are, and I mean, there's lots more work than, than this, but there's sort of a one um, end of the spectrum, the idea that there's no constraints or no absolute constraints on structural borrowing. Anything goes, you can do anything, you can borrow anything, anything can change. Um, but then the work of Thompson and Kaufman and, and others suggest that borrowing is also not entirely arbitrary. So you, they propose things like a borrowing scale, um, you know, you might borrow lexical items before you change word order and, and things like that. So that will be kind of um, familiar from the kind of broader language change, language contact um, type of work. Um, I suppose I will say that actually even the first bit where I say there's a broad agreement or broad consensus, um, there's probably not even consensus on that because I think some people don't think that there is any such thing as contact-induced change. Actually, there's only internal change, but that might be from contact, right? So there's only grammaticalization, so I think this is some of Pine and Kateva's work. There's only grammaticalization, but grammaticalization that happens in the, in the, <laughs> in the presence of contact, essentially. Um, so this is all now really familiar and to this audience, but also what we've already heard, so I won't talk about this um, here. Um, but I will get to this, um, which is also hopefully vaguely what I'm known for. Um, so Rangi, which is a work, language that I worked on for my PhD, um, which I finished now in 2012, so some time back, um, and this is a this is the feature that drew me to work on Rangi in the first place, actually. Um, so I remember a discussion with Lutz where I said, oh, I'm interested in language contact. And I think at that stage there were two examples from Rangi from Oliver Stegen um, where it seemed that you ended up with this kind of order in Rangi. So something like the example in one, mother will collect water later, you have the two bits that there are in bold. Um, so essentially the verb comes before the auxiliary. This is the this is the this is an exciting feature um, of Rangi, and this is what drew um, my um, attention to it. Um, in my PhD, I did work on Rangi, I did work on the auxiliaries, um, but I ended up not really talking about language contact um, at all. Um, so it's more descriptive, and then a, an, an analysis within a particular um, theoretical framework, dynamic syntax. Um, but since then, I managed to kind of keep that at the back of my mind, and some of the stuff that I'll talk about today was um, subsequent work. So this is striking as an order. It's unusual in the context of Bantu languages. I've put here East African Bantu, but actually it's unusual in the context of Bantu languages. Um, and it's also typologically unusual for SVO languages. So you expect languages with SVO uh, word order to have the auxiliary before the verb. Um, so actually this links to what Martin was talking about earlier on. Um, so Rangi has been in sustained contact with non-Bantu languages. Uh, Cushitic languages and to a less extent dialectic languages perhaps um, and various work from various different angles and various different people, some of whom are in the room have suggested that this particular word order might be the result of language contact um, and then there is another proposal that it's to do to internal processes of change and I will say right now and I sort of already um, indicated this earlier on, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive um, but this is sort of part of the issue of this kind of um, disentangling, um, I suppose. Um, so I think by, still by way of background, um, one of the things that's really nice about working on Bantu languages is you have these broad similarities, right? So we can talk very easily with each other about, you know, oh, this noun class or this particular morphological feature or whatever. Um, and when that's the case, um, it's often easy to identify features which aren't common, right? So that really stands out. So verb auxiliary order in Rangi, stands out if you're sort of used to, oh yes, this is how the Bantu verb works, this is what happens, or auxiliary verb, and you come across something that's striking. Um, so these may be the result of language contact, or contact-induced change, um, but what I sort of want to kind of highlight um, today, um, and this comes after some joint work with, with Lutz, which I'll be talking about um, in a bit more detail, 
you need to do quite a lot of things to tease that apart. So I think the danger is you say, it's language contact, which I actually think is what you were saying, like, oh, it's language contact, <laughs> which means basically we don't know, right? We, we can't <laughs> explain what happened. It must be contact. Um, but even within that, it's difficult. You need to know the sociolinguistic reality in the present. You need to know the sociolinguistic reality in the past. And actually, another point from earlier on, there's layers of that, right? So it's not even like just now and then, but like lots of thens, right? Lots of different layers in the past, often with the same languages, sometimes with different languages, different power structures, who was dominant or important at the time, who did you want to align yourself with? And here I don't talk about Swahili as well, but yes, we know that that's also um, a sort of important feature in all of this. Um, but there's good news. Um, as more and more people are working on these languages, and I suppose the descriptive status of Bantu languages, but African languages in general, improves, I think we can do this work in even more depth. Um, and there's also opportunities for more kind of interdisciplinary work as well. Someone earlier on mentioned archaeology, people doing work in different fields where I think we can talk to each other and perhaps disentangle things or perhaps not. Um, so I want to explore a little bit about this idea of internal and external factors. Um, I want to draw an example. So the examples that I have here, um, I'm going to be focusing on the work on, on Rangi, but I want to put it in a slightly bigger um, perspective. And I'm going to be using these three criteria, which come from the, the joint work with Lutz, which you'll see um, again and again a little bit later on. Um, sort of criteria for assessing something <laughs> in terms of its likelihood, probability that its contact induced or that it re reflects a grammaticalization pathway. So you take a feature and then you look at it against these things. Um, and you'll see that in more depth um, in a second. Um, I've got some <coughs> examples um, and then s a bit of a summary at the end. And future research really for me includes looking for more features and in more languages, um, essentially, which you'll see later on. So, <coughs> so um, verb auxiliary order, I'm just going to talk about a little bit more, but I think, yeah, those of you who um, known, known some of this work that I've been doing, it'll be a bit more um, familiar anyway. Um, and certainly those of you who are familiar with, yeah, I don't need to sort of talk a little bit about Bantu languages um, here. Or maybe actually I do. I can do this for our friends who are um, here as well. So essentially Bantu languages employ a variety of different strategies for marking tense aspects. And in fact, yes, you're interested in tense aspects, so it's, this is a good <laughs> thing to add to the discussion. Um, morphological marking, uh, tone, which in the Swahili example, Swahili doesn't have tone, so we don't have that there, and auxiliary construction, so another way of encoding a wider variety of tense aspect um, distinctions. So these Swahili examples, they're what I would just call a simple form. You have a single verb form with the markers which are in bold, not sure how clear that is, um, showing present progressive in that case, or, or past tense, or whatever. So that's a sort of, this is the typical um, kind of example. Um, and then you have an auxiliary construction. So I haven't given you the, the basic auxiliary construction, but I've gone right um, to this. Um, so here we have examples from uh, Rangu, where you see a future tense construction in each instance. So four is like an uh, immediate future, and five is a general or distant future. Um, and this is this um, auxiliary construction. So the striking thing here is that, again, we have verb before the auxiliary uh, in, in both cases, um, and you know, object type thing um, uh, later on. So this is the order, and crucially, it's ungrammatical, unacceptable to do the other order, right? So this is not, yes, you might say in some instances there's uh, free word order or pragmatic effects or whatever. This is out, right? So an attempt to say something like, I will cook food with our inflected auxiliary before our main verb in Rangi, at least, is no good. So, so yeah, I said I was going to be talking mainly about um, Rangi. Um, typologically unusual, comparatively unusual in the context of East African Bantu, but Rangi is not alone in this word order. So, yeah, I started looking at Rangi. Um, Martin had the, the work on uh, Mbugwe, where you also have examples um, of verbal auxiliary order. So then, by the end of my PhD, I had examples from two. Uh, languages, um, and then I've since found four more. Um, so they form two sort of clusters, if you want. So Rangin and Bugwe are down here in central uh, Tanzania. Um, I've got a bit of a gap. So the green is not <laughs> the green's lots of other things, right? So you don't have to <laughs> think about it so much. There's lots of things going on there. Um, it's not that there's no languages, um, but yeah. So Rangin and Bugwe, and they share a joint past, but there's intervening languages um, in that area at the moment. But then, crucially, these other four languages are spoken in a completely, completely different area of Tanzania and Kenya, at least.
but they are spoken in close contact with each other. Some of them are directly in contact. So you have these two sort of clusters which exhibit um, this word order. Um, still sort of trying to tell you that it's unusual, but yes, okay, we now have it um, uh, in, in six languages. Um, so again, just sort of a, a sort of taste of the data, essentially. You see the same thing in these other languages. Um, so this is examples from Simbiti and Kusi. Again, verb, auxiliary, uh, object, um, and um, same in uh, Mbugwe and um, some joke what have you do with Tim Roth and Ngureme as well, um, this verb um, auxiliary order. Um, I will say here, um, micro variation, so what tenses you find them in. Um, uh, I can just go back, for example, here. You see that in both Simbiti and uh, Gusi, you have this n, which is glossed here as a focus marker um, on the front of the infinitive, which you don't have in, in Rangi and Mbugwe, for example. Um, the auxiliaries, I think, are sort of derived from the same Bantu, proto-Bantu kind of root. Um, so that's, that's sort of ndi or ndri or something like that. Um, uh, Ngureme also has another one which is ni, but yeah, the Mbugwe examples actually have different tense aspect combinations and different auxiliary forms, which some of which are more transparently related to uh, verbal origins as well. So there's variation, but they're united by the presence of this unusual verb auxiliary order to, to some extent. Um, so what I want to sort of assume um, and hope to kind of convince you all, is that the verb auxiliary order is not of a Bantu inheritance, but it's some kind of innovation. Um, I'm assuming that on the basis of the fact that even with six languages, and even if you put the estimate of Bantu languages at the low end and say it's something like 450, and I haven't checked them all, but these are the ones I've identified it in, it's still a small number. Um, as I said earlier on, unusual for SVO languages. Um, and also, in some of these languages, you still find auxiliary verb order. So either in specific tenses or in specific syntactic contexts. So I'm still sort of saying the dominant order, the, the verbal auxiliary order, is unusual in its innovation. So where does it come from? Right? So my original thing was like, ah, language contact. Um, so actually, we've, yeah, in our thousand years of contact in East Africa, we've already had this. Um, so central Tanzania area, long history of language contact. I won't go um, into that now, just in the interest of time. This is um, a little map, and I don't expect you to really be able to see anything except for, hopefully, uh, the colours. Um, so the idea here is that the green languages, which before were all just green, there weren't any languages on the other map, the green languages are Bantu languages. Um, this kind of, I suppose, dark purple um, is nilotic, languages of the nilotic family. Um, the kind of lighter purpley lilac um, is uh, Cushitic. Um, and they have what they call Khoisan here, so these yellow ones here. So the idea here is that even if you don't know what the languages are, they're just they're numbered. Um, the area that I'm talking about is somewhere in the middle there. There's, yeah, there's Babati, so somewhere in the middle there. You have languages from different language families right in this area. So the, the kind of striking thing is that these are unrelated languages um, in contact and have been um, for a long time. Oh, <laughs> that's... <laughs> Yeah, that's where I was uh, looking at earlier on. Um, okay, so let's say it's to do with language contact. You start looking around for a possible source, um, for, for the example. Um, and yes, I didn't look. Uh, you know, I, I looked at the Iraq um, grammar. In fact, I think this is, and saw this kind of construction um, for uh, the future. So in Rangi, the verbal auxiliary order is associated with the future. These two future forms. Um, and I was sort of thinking, okay, well, I'm looking for some origin um, for this. And here you have these constructions which uh, seem to involve something like an infinitive or a verbal form, non-verbal form, like drinking, followed by an auxiliary. Um, again, it's sort of involved in the same at the bottom there, so doing plus um, go. So, you know, is this the candidate, is this where this verbal auxiliary construction was uh, borrowed from? Um, so, uh, well, I suppose the answer is no, but um, just to sort of <laughs> walk you there, it's not as straightforward as that, right? So perhaps, uh, sadly, um, looking for a possible candidate for this order to have come from, um, and I think yeah, Martin sort of uh, mentioned that yeah, these examples are perhaps marginal. There's other much more widespread or more common ways of forming these kind of constructions. Um, again, from a kind of cross-linguistic perspective, using an auxiliary type thing based on go, that's widespread for marking a future tense, so there's nothing particularly striking about that. Um, 
And so far, I've not found any good, any candidates at all, actually, but certainly not any good candidates for borrowing of this verb auxiliary order from Alagua um, and the Burungue, which are the other two kind of primary, actually, in present day, primary contact uh, languages for Rangi, and actually, yeah, we uh, were mentioning that um, earlier on. So, yeah, that's not sort of, haven't got very far with that. So the alternative, if you take that it's either one or the other, is that the verb auxiliary order comes from some kind of language internal process of change. Um, and I have here evidence, or what I think of as, as sort of evidence, or something that murkies the water a bit from two domains, um, from morphology and in terms of tense aspects. So pursuing a sort of language internal account for this, um, I mentioned this earlier on, so in four of the six languages that have this order, you have this focus marker, or what's been described as in the previous literature as a focus marker, um, on this verb, right? So even though the translation is I was harvesting or something like that, perhaps a fossilised uh, focus marker, um, it's worth saying that although, so these examples, these are not my own, but um, these are from published sources and some of the others as well, they say like focused present or focused present progressive, but there is no unfocused present. So there's not a like unfocused counterpart. So perhaps historically vocal, no longer um, vocal. So, so keeping in mind that there's this mm type thing, a focus marker, one suggestion is that this verb auxiliary order has its origins in a cleft construction, right? So you would have at some stage had the standard Bantu order auxiliary verb. Um, then you would have been able to have an auxiliary verb or verb auxiliary, depending on what you're trying to do with the construction. And now, present day, stage three, where you end up with verb auxiliary. So the idea here is, just going back to the Lucy example, is this would have been something like, it was harvesting, um, I was, I am doing, or it is harvesting, I am doing, right? So a cleft construction with the n. Um, for again, for those who aren't as familiar with Bantu languages, something like n being perhaps shortened, uh, reduced version of ni, so a copula form, so a copula um, construction form with a cleft. So one suggestion here is that yes, you would have got at the verb auxiliary order through a cleft construction with ni, so it, it or it, sorry, it was harvesting. I was doing something like that. Um, the idea here, again, because this isn't any longer focused, it seems, is that that focal reading is now lost, and this is just how you form this construction now. This is just how you form the past progressive or the past um, habitual, or whatever you want to kind of, um, call it. Um, so these would be the stages of the process, which means that at some point in the development of the language in stage two, both were possible with different pragmatics, stage three, Verb auxiliary is just what you find um, in these constructions. So that's the kind of first piece of um, explanation, really, rather than evidence, um, perhaps. Um, the second bit is um, related to sort of uh, tense aspect um, work. So this is, again, so this is sort of now steps um, slightly to the, the side. There has been work that has suggested that the progressive is an inherently focal category in Bantu languages. Um, so the idea here is that somehow encoding progressive, or for some reason encoding progressive, was focal in contrast to some other forms. Um, and the support for this idea comes from a range of observations. So for example, and there's sort of three points to this, the same element is used as a copula and to convey predicate focus. So this is our ny or our ni type thing. So something like he will buy meat would be our unmarked form. These are kikuyu examples. Um, he will buy meat, buy and then meat, um, but to make, so to sort of convey the emphasis on the, on the predicate on buy, use this focal marker, this knee marker, so something like he will buy meat is the best you can do in English, so here with, with caps. Um, so you have this copula form that you use to convey um, predicate focus. Um, you then have, so this is now, so this is cross Bantu evidence, right? So it might be within the same language, but it might be in different languages. So then here, examples from higher, you use the same marker for the copula, so the identification of copula, and to mark progressive aspect. Again, it's still our knee form, right? So they tie him up, just unform, unmarked subject marker, object marker, whatever. Progressive, translated here as they are tying him up, is the same thing. Uh, this, I don't know if that's me or if that's them with the, the bar, the subject marking, but the difference here that's crucial for our purposes is the knee, right? So the knee now in 17 encodes progressive, they are tying him up. Um, again, just to show you other uses of knee in higher, knee kato, it is kato. So this is our copula form still. 
So we have forms marked marking the progressive, forms marking um, predicate focus. Um, and, crucially for, for purposes here, the same marker for predicate focus and for progressive aspect. So these three things, or these two things, I suppose, the idea here is that the same things mark uh, focus and progressive, or predicate focus and progressive, <coughs> or progressive and you know, copular forms and copular. And again, it's, uh, it's new, or it's our knee um, type thing, so this is a different language um, from Canva, so we do those things, just our post verbal. Uh, uh, nominal form, and then if you want to emphasize or yeah, fo make focus on the verb or the predicate, you have this n, um, and in 21, this is supposed to be, I, I guess, a progressive, so they're laughing or they're about to laugh, immediate, you use that same form. So this is a sort of broader picture that people have used to um, propose that this idea that the progressive is, is focal um, in Bunting. So how does that relate to what I'm sort of talking about in terms of the verb auxiliary order? Um, well, I haven't given you a full rundown of all of the constructions in the six languages, um, but you take my word for it or, or, or look at some of the other the work on it. Um, all of these languages, the verb auxiliary order is to some extent associated with progressive or habitual aspects. Actually, the exception to this is Rangi, um, but in Rangi it's the future, and I would argue that the future is then not a massive extension from something like progressive or, or something like that. So again, it's all within sort of plausible pathways of change. Um, this is some of the, the, the work that sort of said that the progressive is inherently uh, focal, so Hyman Waters and then Tom Gulderman more recently, where you see these same morphemes being used to derive progressive meanings of form focus. So Tom Goldman, he proposed that there is actually a grammaticalization climb going from something like present, unmarked present, um, then being marked for predicate focus, to then going to become a present progressive form. So I don't know, I tend to sort of think of tense and aspects and information structure as quite different types of things. And the suggestion here is that actually you can grammaticalize or grammaticalization goes from a predicate focus at least, not all focus type of focus, to present progressive. So the proposal here is that if we're looking at this idea of a language internal account of the verb auxiliary order, it was initially used to convey predication focus. It was then reanalyzed as marking progressive aspect or as being associated with progressive aspect. And for some languages, that's where it stopped. Um, and then for other languages, whether by analogy or through other grammaticalization pathways, it developed out into other tense aspect combinations. Crucially in there, the focal reading has been lost. So this is now how you encode the future tense, or it's how you encode the habitual, past habitual, or whatever. So this would be our language internal account of the verb auxiliary, or the, or the rise of the verb auxiliary order. Um, two distinct pathways of change. OK, don't need to go into that. So again, this is a, a paper that uh, Lutz and I um, have, and these are our three things that I kind of flagged up at the, at the beginning. So taking so far what, what we have here is syntactic structure, morphological form, and geographic distribution, and then seeing to what extent these things support here either contact account or grammaticalization account. So in terms of structure, you say something like, well, the verb auxiliary order is unusual for these languages. So that suggests that it's more likely to do with contact. Um, on the other hand, you can make some kind of functional explanation, so information structure-based explanation, which supports grammaticalization. So essentially, if you're doing points or something, it's like one, 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 right? Or one on either side. Morphological form, actually, this is, this is stronger in terms of the grammaticalization route. So I didn't go through all the details, but like re um, is reconstructed for proto, so it seems to be linked to proto banto reconstructed copula form. Um, the, the immediate auxiliary uh, in Rangi seems to come from the verb come. Certainly the Mbugwe examples, again, the auxiliary is more transparently linked to verbs, perhaps. So that suggests, OK, we haven't borrowed the morphological form from these non-Bantu languages. We've used you know, Bantu morph morphological forms. So that's on that side. Um, geographic distribution, so of our X number of Bantu languages, very geographically dis uh, restricted. So East Africa, East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, and actually these two clusters. Um, and also, all of these languages have been in contact with non-Bantu languages. So if anything, this is on the contact side, right? So it's more likely to say, OK, yes, actually, this suggests it is contact, because otherwise, 
you, if it was just to do with information structure, you might expect it to be equally distributed amongst Bantu languages as an information strategy, sorry, an information structure, um, you know, encoding uh, strategy. Um, so, what, what time did we start? We started at or a what, how long did I have? Yeah, okay, so good. Okay. So, so this, is, this is the first part of the story, and this is what I started working on, so just looking at um, on this order. And so what you then do is look for other things, or what we then did is look for other things and see, well, if that's the case, are there other candidates for structural transfer, for borrowing from other languages, uh, sorry, in the same language that might give a larger picture? I suppose primarily because whatever you think about how language change happens or how contact-induced change happens, it would be very unusual if this was a contact feature and there are no other features in the language which suggested it had been influenced by you know, contact, right? So again, sort of keeping these in mind and thinking of them as candidates for contact-induced change, um, and then seeing where it sort of all ends up. So, um, uh, clause final negation. It's slightly like looking for a needle in a haystack. I think that's the expression. So you look at a language and then you're looking for things that are unusual, right? You're looking for things that are non-canonical Bantu um, features, um, and then deciding whether you still think they are by the time you've looked at them. So here's the example on so clause final negation. Um, so main clause negation in Rangi is achieved through these two markers. So it's a bypass site negation strategy. Um, the example in 22, something like today our friends did not come. You have C and then you have Tuku at the end. Um, what's the other one? The chickens will not give us eggs. Again, you have C and Tuku. Um, it can either be after the verb or it can be clause finally, um, perhaps with some differences of have scope there, but I'm, I'm not sort of, uh, haven't looked at that in detail. <coughs> you have these two, <coughs> these two markers um, sort of indicating uh, negation. So, sort of stepping back, Bantu languages use a wide range of strategies to uh, convey negation. Um, main clause negation has been noticed to be most commonly um, indicated through what's called ver like verb internally. So some marker within the verb, either, well, in, a, in one of a, of a number of positions. Either before, so what in, in Bantu terminology is called the pre-initial position, so before a subject marker, or the post-initial position after the subject marker, in, in both cases this is before um, the verb stem, so very familiar for, for some of you. Um, in addition to that, there are other strategies. So some languages do mark it post-verbally, so after the whole um, verb. You know, they've got to the end of the verb, and then you have a negative marker. This last strategy has been more associated with non-main clause contexts. So I don't know, uh, subordinate clauses and different types of, of things. Not so much our simple, like our friends did not come, or the chicken will not give us eggs. Am I the only one drinking coffee? I feel like you should all learn. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew I had a, a, a friend here. I promised to tap dance. If I was someone like Yenneke, I'd have got you to do exercises. Or <laughs> I'd got everyone to stand up, wouldn't I? Um, feel free to stand up if you need to, if you're on London time. Um, so, negation. Yes. So, historically, this kind of negation is not associated with main clauses. So, you know, my language contact radar, the little, you know, uh, alarm bell start ringing. I'd say, oh, that's, a, that's sort of interesting. What's that about? Um, so it seems that this C at the beginning, the one that comes before the verb, um, is, can be traced back to the kind of proto-Bantu um, historical negative marker, um, which has been uh, reconstructed. So that's fine. So I'm less, sort of <laughs> less concerned, less interested, less concerned about that, although that does also do some interesting things as well. Um, but the suggestion here is that Tuku is an innovation from... Uh, possible innovation from or borrowing from neighbouring Cushitic languages. Um, actually, this is a, another uh, nice example. So um, the, this is the verb auxiliary order the other way around. So verb auxiliary order is maintained in main clauses, but in negation it swaps around. So future tense would usually be verb auxiliary, but as soon as it's in a negative construction, it goes back to auxiliary verb. So this is just also showing you how the variation um, works within the language. So. Post-verbal negation is not unusual in East African Bantu. Okay, there's other languages which have it. There's other languages in the area which have that. Different strategies across the language family, fine. Um, so there's two sort of primary present-day uh, contact languages um, for, for, well, 
these of the two <laughs> primary present-day uh, contact languages from Rangi both have um, lexical items which are similar in form. So here I have something uh, like Tuku from Burunge, which has been described as expressing something like entirely or wholly. Um, and then the Lagwa example, I don't know, if, uh, hopefully that's not in the Greece, but um, something more like express completeness or totality. So um, here, something to do with these lexical items. So they're not negative markers in these languages. Right, so there's, there's other ways of encoding negation. These are not it. But what we did, and here this is um, joint work with, with Vera uh, Wilhelmsen, we say that Tuku ref is borrowed from these languages, and then it became incorporated into a cross-linguistically common pathway of change, the Esperson cycle, so it was used as an intensifier. So essentially you had C for the negative marking, and then you took on Tuku to say not at all, right? So we weren't, uh, the chicken would not give us eggs at all. So initially, it was emphatic, it added force to the negation, and then over time, grammaticalized to now just be the standard form of negation is this bipartite construction um, in, in Rangi, right? So here we have lexical borrowing or borrowing of the form, um, not borrowing, well, not borrowing the negation strategy from these languages, but borrowing this kind of to totality, entirety, um, intensifier uh, form. Um, the, so, the, so there's Rangi and Mbugwe spoken in that sort of middle cluster of languages um, and looking at negation in Mbugwe as well. Um, here we have this example which shows it's a very similar form. Crucially in Mbugwe, the toko is emphatic, right? So the translation for this is, we did not run to the hospital at all. So here, the sort of proposal we made was that actually Rangi and Mbugwe are at different stages of this pathway of change. In Rangi, the tuku is obligatory, so you can't just have see it on its own, it has to be obligatory. So it's lost that emphatic, it's lost the, the kind of focal contribution, um, whereas in Bugwe, it's uh, optional, at least uh, here, and so it's adding that emphasis. And so the distribution between the two <coughs> shows you that these two languages have gone through similar process of change in terms of the Esperson cycle, but they're at different stages of the process. So this, if you like, is our second candidate for contact-induced change. Um, borrowing of structure, or borrowing a form if you want, but for a um, different kind of purpose. So again, we put this into sort of the same little rubric if you want, um, structure, morphological form, and geographic distribution. Um, so in terms of structure, bipartite negation doesn't say, doesn't sort of shout contact, right? There's bipartite negation um, marking in other Bantu languages. Um, however, uh, this cross-linguistically kind of common pathway of change if anything supports the grammaticalization account, right? Take a marker using, used as an intensifier, go through the, the stages um, as has been described widely cross-linguistically. So if anything, that's more on the grammaticalization side of things. Um, morphological form, or just in fact the form, it seems that neighboring Cushitic, Cushitic languages are a really good candidate for the source of the form of the negative marker, supports contact. Um, Geographic distribution, we've got something on either side. So clause final negation prevalent in the non-Bantu languages of the area. So yeah, uh, uh, yeah the Burungi and Alagua, it's not the same form, but there is uh, uh, clause final negation after the verb. Um, but also clause final negation is actually widespread across Bantu. And, you, and not just in these languages, or not just in this ge geographic area. So. You know, on both sides or on the fence. It could have been in the middle. I don't know which way you want to sort of look at it. Um, but here you can get this idea of like, so the, the disentangling, or, the, or the, the promised disentangling is actually, even if you're looking at one feature, you're sort of really drilling down and thinking like, oh, okay, well, on this hand, yes, and on you know, the other hand, this. Um, sort of a bit more yeah, complex and perhaps more fine grained um, approach needed. Um, I have a, another example here, and then I'm, uh, I've got my sort of, I don't know, broader um, discussion points, I suppose. Um, so, uh, Rangi has an inclusive exclusive distinction in first person plural possessive pronouns. Um, so, the examples here um, are, are, are supposed to show that. So, example 26 today I angered our grandfather and I'm talking with Andrew, and when I say our grandfather, it's not Andrew's grandfather as well, right? It's not yours, crucially, it's ours, and I'm talking about all my other 
uh, cousins, I suppose. Um, so here, this is the exclusive use, or the exclusive uh, form, um, so the, the we two form. And then if it is inclusive, it's the form you have in 27, the death of both of R, or the death of R relative in Condoa, and that's a shared, uh, a shared one. Um, so we have these two uh, forms. So again, from a kind of comparative perspective, and those who are familiar with uh, Bantu languages, and when I was looking at this, I thought, well, that's striking, right? That's not something that I have come across in other... In fact, does, any, does anyone know other Bantu languages? Because if you do... <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I'm still on the lookout for some others. Um, Cameroon? Okay, that's, that can go in our... That's way. far, right? Yeah, it's far, but it's, <laughs> but it, it's far, but it's helpful, because, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not a... Yeah, probably not a contact language, but it's as a, as a broader picture. Um, so, yeah, that struck me as something that was very, yeah, atypical um, in that sense. Um, so, just to sort of provide the broader context, you don't have this inclusive-exclusive distinction marked on the verb or in personal pronouns, right? So there's not an inclusive we and an exclusive we. You don't find it in verbal marking or anything else. So it's just these two pronominal, possessive pronominal forms. Um, so it's really quite um, restricted. Um, this type of distinction, so inclusivity distinction, is not tested in any of the neighbouring Bantu languages. And I've said no Bantu languages more widely, and let, I should put it in brackets and let you go as far as wide as Cameroon. But yes, you know, that's, that's, yeah, so very you know, uh, uh, restricted or yeah, absent. So then, again, my assumption here, the inclusive-exclusive distinction is not an inherited feature, right? It's not sort of inherited from uh, Proto-Bantu, if you want. Um, it's an innovation of some kind. So again, the question there is, well, where has it come from? So there's different ways in which language can innovate. Um, so the reason, I mean, the Cameroon point is helpful, actually, because it has been... So there is work which shows that uh, in Proto-Bantu, I think there was these five reconstructed um, forms which relate, you know, they sort of relate to um, each other. So even for first-person plural forms, right, there were these five um, reconstructive part, um, parts. Um, the proposal here is, if anything, that the E2 comes from the E2, I suppose, and the E3 from the, the last one there. Um, so the form, the you know, the morphological form from Rangi, in Rangi is, is okay. That's not sort of doesn't seem to be borrowed or whatever. Um, but these were not reconstructed as I exclusive and inclusive, right? They were just reconstructed. Actually, I don't know what the difference between the five forms in the series was. The forms existed, but not necessarily um, with, these, with these meanings. Um, so here, you can say, although these different forms, like if we look at uh, the different languages, you'll find that these different forms are, are present. Um, there are not other languages which have this inclusive-exclusive distinction. Um, having said that, I also looked at the neighboring non-Bantu languages in the area, because you then mm -hmm. go to look for contact, and there aren't other non-Bantu languages in the area which have an inclusive exclusive distinction either, right? So you can sort of say, oh, this is striking, it must be contact, but then a bit like with the verbal auxiliary order, when you look for that contact you know, source, it's not, um, not there. So yeah, uh, Gora, Iraku, um, Burungi, and Alagua, um, I haven't found any examples. Um, so there are languages in East Africa which have inclusive exclusive distinctions, um, Somali, um, notably, and Amharic, um, but these are, I mean, geographically, these are way out of the picture, really. Like, they're not contact languages for Rangi. They're not even, you know, the sort of in this part of, of Tanzania. Certainly any type of contact is really rules these out as the source for an inclusive-exclusive um, distinction. Um, from a kind of cross-linguistic perspective, inclusive-exclusive distinctions are quite widespread. Um, but in the kind of typological literature, you find them much more commonly in the Americas. Um, and actually, I think Africa, when they <laughs> rank them by continent, Africa is really, like, they're rare. So, typologically, yes, inclusive-exclusive distinction, um, fine, but no other Bantu languages in the area, and also, crucially, no other non-Bantu languages in the area. So what we're left with there is a proposal that it is an independent innovation in Rangu. <coughs> um, although the forms can be traced back to Proto-Bantu, right? So, so I suppose, what does that mean? The forms were maintained and then mapped onto these two different meanings for some kind of distinction. Um, yeah, I think that's the sort of 
Uh, so again, even if you're looking for kind of contact or, or language internal, this is you know, mm. language internal. Um, but yeah, an innovation in terms of the encoding, right? An innovation in terms of meaning, um, uh, even if the forms are new forms. So I think that's the, that's the difference. Um, so again, we put it into our sort of um, our, our chart. Um, okay, syntactic structure, perhaps not, that's not quite the right time here. But typologically, inclusive exclusive distinction as a sort of structure is is fine, or as a concept is something that's kind of notably um, you know, present across the world. Um, morphological form can be traced back or can be yes, yeah, sort of mapped back onto proto-Bantu forms. So that, if anything, supports grammaticalization, but not with these meanings, as far as we, we know. Um, and then geographic distribution, these have gone in the middle. Um, not found in other Bantu languages, if anything, would support contact but not found in the non-Bantu languages in the area either, grammaticalization. So really, I mean, just not, I could have just left that cell uh, blind, I suppose. Um, so neither. So it, or if anything, weakly you know, supports it very, very slightly. Um, so leaving us with this idea that it's an innovation, like language internal innovation, albeit um, with a form that can be uh, traced back. Um, so these were our sort of um, case studies. I've got a little bit of a summary and some further um, work. So I think that, and you know, other people have been saying the same thing, Bantu language is a really good case study or a really good lens through which to explore issues like language contact and, and change. Micro variation meaning that there is differences, there are differences, but also typological similarity meaning that some of these more striking differences really like, stand out. So inclusive exclusive distinction you know, sort of, uh, uh, is, is striking. Um, I wanted to look, I sort of started off with the verbal auxiliary stuff, which is what I've looked at in much more detail over the years, um, and saying that this is unusual from a comparative perspective and typological perspective, and you can sort of map these two arguments if you want, and sort of say, okay, well, this is the contact-induced account, and this is the language internal um, account. I, prob I think probably the best... The, the, the sort of conclusion to that is that is language internal change in the presence of high levels of language contact, right? So actually, again, just coming back to this idea of both of those things playing a role. So if you think it's just language internal, it's difficult to account for the fact that it's only languages with a high level of language contact with non bantu languages that have these features. If you just think it's a contact-induced account, you can't explain other features like the negation and, and sort of other things that I haven't talked about so much um, here. Um, and you also can't explain why it's in certain tenses and why it's not in others, um, and, and lots of other sort of micro variations. Um, so uh, this is, yeah, I mean, this is um, again sort of saying the same kind of thing. So if you look at these features, you might think, yes, great candidate. This is structural borrowing from a neighbouring non-Bantu language. Um, it's only if you look a bit more in a bit more detail that you can see. Well, is it? Um, I think this sort of third point is one of the things I wanted to kind of raise, particularly with this, this sort of group of people. Um, issues to do with methodology, right? So I mean, really, these, what, three <laughs> examples really take a lot of, you need to understand the situation and the language you're looking at, and then I need to also know that the languages that are nearby have been described, and I can go and look at the descriptions of those languages and see what's going on, as well as you know, sociolinguistic present and, and past and things like that. Um, and I'm not uh, like a historical linguist, for example. I don't do sort of you know, reconstruction. I've not talked anything at all about like phonology and those kind of things, right? So, like this is sort of big pieces of work, perhaps interlocking and perhaps with lots of people um, uh, in, involved. And also the point that I've sort of been trying to kind of say along the way is that I don't think that these two things are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with the fact that all of this stuff is is messier than you might perhaps on first um, sight like to sort of like it to be. Um, uh, so in terms of future research, and this is kind of actually like, I suppose, current research, so the sort of early work, well, looking at the verb auxiliary order, as I said earlier on, like initially started with, with Rangian and Wugwe, looking at it in six languages has given a different perspective, so you can look at variation, the n, the ni focus type marker, I wouldn't have known about if I hadn't found it in these other languages, so that's added support to that particular argument. Um, also, the patterns in terms of tense aspect become much clearer if you have six languages. Originally, I was looking for what is it about the future tense 
And actually, it's nothing particularly about the future tense, but you get it in these other, um, other sort of constructions. So by looking at more languages, you can kind of start filling up pieces of the, the puzzle as well. Um, and that brings me on to the, the last um, point, which is, well, that sort of those three examples. So the verb auxiliary order is shared by these six languages. But then the other two examples I had from Rangu, they're just from this language. So ideally, what I'd like to do is look at other languages and look and see well, what other features do these languages have, which you know can be assessed in similar terms in terms of contact or in terms of you know internal processes um, of change. And that's the sort of future um, stuff. So again, I said I haven't really talked about um, <laughs> phonology <laughs> um, for. for Good reasons, I, I'm not a phonologist, but um, there are things that have been observed. So just taking the six languages with the verb auxiliary order, you have this asymmetric vowel height um, in Gureme, which has been proposed it might be a contact feature. I've got an example of that um, on, on the next slide. Um, bipartite neg negation in Gureme and Simbiti, so they also have a verb final, uh, oh, sorry, a clause final negative marker. It's not tuku, it's uh, hey. Um, so, is that, yeah, is that, you know, Bantu, is that something else? Um, different kind of causative and passive constructions uh, or ways of forming constructions, but of course, like lots of other features and again, like lexicon and things like that. Um, so looking at the languages, then looking to see what other features there are that stand out from this kind of guess, broader perspective, and, and then what do you do? Um, so with the... Um, uh, the vowel height in Greme, so this is some of um, Tim Roth's work, um, has this thing that Greme has seven vowels in nouns, but only five vowels in verbs. Um, so these are near minimal pairs, I think. Um, so you can, I mean, his thesis, I think that was, yeah, where are we now, 2019. Thesis has uh, lots more um, e uh, uh, examples, but this is kind of give, give you a, a snapshot. So here you might sort of say, well, that's striking, right? So seven vowels, yes, fine. Five vowels, yes, fine. Seven vowels in nouns, five vowels in verbs, um, what's going on? Um, and again, so if you were sort of taking a similar approach, um, so there's some work on Bila, for example, from DRC, which says that Bila has acquired additional vowels in the verbs, or the verbal system, um, and not in the nouns, so presumably, again, uh, I don't know how many it has in total, but either seven, five, or, or whatever you end up with. So that would be kind of a broader, not a contact language, but broader picture saying, like, oh yeah, languages can acquire you know, a higher level of um, you know, vocalic uh, distinctions. In the case of contact, that's been supposed to be the result of contact. Um, here, I'm not sure what the source for this is, but it says Datoga has seven vowels in verbs and five in um, nouns. Actually, it's the wrong way around, right? So it's not directly the same as in Gureme, but again, if it is the case that there is a distinction in terms of verbal and nominal and the extent of the, of the vowels, um, then is that, you know, a sort of contact feature? Uh, and then I suppose my question would be, so could you then do the same kind of thing, right? So does, does this, from a kind of methodological perspective, can you apply the same thing? So um, structure and form, asymmetrical vowel system, so there is a language which has been proposed has developed an analogous construction or analogous system through contact, so that would support contact. Um, seven vowel system widespread in Bantu, so that supports, I don't know if it supports grammaticalization, but that's where the seven would have, would have come from. Maybe you're looking more at sort of a loss. What is it about these forms that means you've lost it? Um, maybe the Toga has seven vowels in verbs and five in nouns should actually be uh, contact, but I don't think that's the primary um, contact for Ngareme. That would be, okay, so that's the wrong way around. So it's not quite that you've borrowed you know, the same, that it just maps, maps across. Um, Ngareme, so that's one of the languages on the, on the uh, cluster off in the, um, north, in the west of Kenya, the north of Tanzania. Um, present day contact is mainly with Nilotic, and then there was historically um, Cushitic languages there um, as well. But also, like, do you, can you just use the same things, right? So this is something, I mean, we, you know, this was the approach that we took for the features that we looked at in Rangi. They were structural, syntactic -y type things. Um, do I really want to say structure, geographic distribution, morphological form when I'm talking about, like, a vowel system or something? Like, would there be different questions that I want to ask? Um, and should they have sort of similar or equal weighting um, depending on what you're looking at. So do you sort of say, okay, well actually, 
structural changes happen in a way that's different from lexical borrowing, which is different from, I don't know, you know phonological influences or, or things like that. So these are sort of questions also about how would you go about this, how would you assess it, you know, is this a sort of um, uh, the right way to, to do any of that. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I don't need to, we can go back to that. I think that's it. <laughs> And also, yeah, I've, uh, I feel a bit uh, pressure because you know, I will talk about uh, post-verbal mediation tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, but yeah, so what, what I'm uh, thinking is that, you know, so the all negation is a kind of very typical feature of the macro Sudan world, right? Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it's something different from mm -hmm. one, two mm -hmm. types of so what, what I understand is that there must be a kind of difference and the qualificational difference between the Bantu type of deobligation and non-Bantu type of deobligation. What do you think about it? Uh, in terms of, how would you assess it? Like when you say difference? No, I mean in it's very hard to uh, assess the difference, but uh, I think at least in Bantu type, it's a, as you said, you know, it's a, the post-verbal negation yeah. that's introduced through the, you know, Yes, but it's inside. Yeah. It's a kind yeah. of uh, pragmatic mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. something. Yeah. And uh, that's in uh, you know, Lombantu, yeah. maybe different. I'm not so sure, but so I would like to know your opinion. So I suppose I, I was asking the, the question back in that I think mm -hmm. the origins are probably different, but I imagine that what you mm -hmm. end up with is similar. Right, in, in terms of the structure, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, in the uh, Mbugwe example, then, you know, there's this pragmatic, mm. perhaps, you know, still having some pragmatics. But once that's gone, mm. you end up essentially with, yeah, you know, mm. this negation, mm. negative marker perhaps after the, after the um, object in the same way. I don't know enough about the macro sedan. Mm -hmm. Belt to know what, what variation might mm -hmm. be possible there. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, even within Bantu, so I mean, there's the work by uh, Lord DeVos and Johan van der Over where they identify like seven common sources for mm -hmm. these negative markers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think comparatively, you can really come up with some, I don't know what they're often the same things, which mm -hmm. again is why we thought the Tuku kind of stood out because mm -hmm. it's not a locative marker, it's a common one, negative word. Yeah. Or, you know, neg yeah, negative word and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess once it's gone through those changes, the end product, if you want, is mm -hmm. is similar, um, and then you can do it again, right? So you mm -hmm. even end up with yeah. three or four markers. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. But and uh, also, yeah, I would like to know. So I, maybe I, we can uh, ask maybe Andrew or Christina mm -hmm. about the post-verbal negation mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, it's post verbal negation in four lines. The anti K. And then the EK is a, is a past marker, or is a negative marker, right? You mark at the end of the the end of the verb. Mm -hmm. So I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, is it Basel? 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 Ah, Alagwa yeah. and uh, Burongo and Ba. Can I say something about this historically? Please. Because I find uh, the, 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 to make your story more complex. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in I need the same way. <laughs> 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 um, I find it interesting with the negation. Mm. The, uh, Southern Kushidic um, has this post verbal negation as an innovation. Ah. Mm -hmm. So the the Alakwa Burunge, we know they have the same marker mm -hmm. uh, and they are not in the same subgroup. Sub so that is one of the reasons that we know it's also, I mean, relatively recent. Mm -hmm. And they are both uh, grammaticalizations with internal material 
of the same structure sentence is finished or is absent. So the final marker comes from a construction, a verb, a negative verb, mm -hmm. and, and the whole sentence is followed by what you cross there as infinitive yeah. or predicative, yeah. as making the identification of clause, popular kind of thing, yeah. or not in the absent. absent. So, so Martin, that's the, that's the buff? That's the buff, and that's the ka. Yeah, ka. the ka. It's the same. That's the yeah, yeah. It's exactly. yeah, so it's the same. Yeah. conceptual thing that drove it, but it must have happened independently. So, um, but there's an innovation too. So they both innovated, <laughs> and maybe they influence each other, likely. I think it ties up a little bit with what you ended up with with the vowels. The yeah. general idea is okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is a function of contact. Uh, what I argued for is to, to, to feel the need. The other thing is to 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 have a frame that uh, makes it possible for you to to do that, even if it is against against the the, the yeah the, the typological trend. Mm -hmm. So that might work with auxiliary. So those, if people are bilingual and they're used to yeah. having negation at the end, yeah. then it's easier to allow, uh, to reinterpret tuku as yeah. uh, also negation yeah. marker. To add to that complexity, <laughs> tuku, to me, yeah. nalakwa is borrowed from Maasai. Ah. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, and then, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I d I'm not completely sure, but I know that it is that the Yaku people who have to go mm -hmm. have that from from Maasai, mm -hmm. and it is common in Maasai to go. So uh, that must have played a role too. So I think yeah, the the negation the layers on top of one yeah, point. and and I think people being multilingual in these languages. Uh, uh, are influenced by the structures of the other language that they speak yeah. uh, in what kind of internal forces that there are, uh, are, are allowed or strengthened or stimulated to be used. I think mm. this is how the two cannot be disentangled probably. That, that they, yes. But I mean that is why I think that Occam's razor is blunt because yeah. I mean your, 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 your example of, um, of the <laughs> Um, the possession shows that you don't need yeah. any argumentation of contact yeah. Uh, yeah. at all. So, but I think even if you don't not logically need it, it being a historical science mm. that you try to make a most convincing yeah. story, it, it does help your story to convince uh, the fact that the, the multilingual situation provides structure that, that, that support uh, innovations that would otherwise probably not survive in an environment. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. <laughs> 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 you had a non-Bantu influence there in the in the Victoria area. Yes. Uh, is that uh, law? Or uh, y yes. Yeah. Uh, what is there in law that that allows us to have this order? From the verb auxiliary order? From the auxiliary, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so once I once I had, so originally when I was looking at Rangin and Bugwe, I was looking for a language yeah. that was spoken there that would be yeah. a good source of yeah. it. Yeah. When I found these Lake Victoria languages, yeah. and there's no common, I mean, apart from Swahili, there's no yeah. common no contact language. Yeah. Um, actually, the closest, I think, would be... Datoga, because there's different varieties there as well, hey, yeah. but I've been oh, told nice. that that's there also very different from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I don't know really about Datoga influence on Rengi and Bugwe in a major, you know, major way either. Um, yeah. But not so much that you end up with verbal delivery order alone, I think. So once I got that, I basically d didn't, you know, look much further. But yeah, I mean, there could be stuff from... It would, would be interesting, and what you could certainly do for Rangi and Bugwe is do some construction in the sense that uh, what part of innovation was done together yeah. and what wasn't. Did, yeah. That would be very nice if we could disentangle mm -hmm. that and the same for the other yeah. languages. Because I mean, conceivably it was two, <laughs> so the alternative is that they both developed in the, 
independently, yes. in contact, but just in contact with different languages, with different orders. So, yeah. so you're looking for, you know, not a construction, but yeah. just the influence from different syntax.